If you'll allow me to editorialize a bit, I'd like to address a regular comment that old school roller derby didn't skate clockwise. Of course they didn't skate clockwise. If you take a cross section of old school derby, you'll notice it didn't change a whole lot over the decades. This is because it was an entertainment, not a sport. And therefore the goal was not to win the game, but it was to get butts in the seats. The Harlem Globetrotters haven't changed their shtick much over the decades either, because what they do is entertaining, but not really basketball. It's as much real basketball as the movie Space Jam. We can appreciate the historical event that was Old School Roller Derby, but shouldn't actually confuse it for sport. Chances are, had roller derby actually been a real sport, they would have had to try to address items like the WFTDA has. And when it comes down to it, what used to be called the direction of gameplay rule is pretty simple. Moving clockwise in derby is dangerous, but not illegal in and of itself. Keep in mind that moving clockwise does not automatically mean you get the penalty in the event of a collision between players. That is still determined by who initiated the action, and that doesn't change just because one or both parties is moving in the non-derby direction. Before we begin, however, I'd like to give you some fair warning. This presentation is not the official word from the WFTDA or MRDA. I am a level 4 referee with the WFTDA, but I am not working for them, and this has no official approval from them. I'm just a guy who wants to help out. And like anything that doesn't come with a WFTDA or MRDA seal of approval, take with an appropriate level of salt. In an effort to keep this presentation as correct as possible, I'm including the date that this presentation was recorded. In the event that I need to update the presentation due to something that was clarified or just out and out wrong, this date will change and there will be an update in the change log that's listed with the presentation on refed.com. This presentation was originally recorded on June 12th, 2016. It has since been updated on February 13, 2017, for the 2017 WFTDA and MRDA rules release. If you look at the 2015 rules, those are the old ones, there is a definition of how a skater moves clockwise. And even though we're playing under the 2017 rules, this definition still does a pretty good job. It says that clockwise is determined by the direction the skates are moving in. Let me emphasize, the direction the skates are moving in, not pointing in, and not how the rest of the body or parts of the body are moving, the direction the skates are moving. I bring this up because I've been asked this and sometimes lectured this. If a skater is skating backwards but still moving in the counterclockwise direction, they cannot get a direction of gameplay penalty. Likewise, if they are skating counterclockwise, but lean clockwise to issue a block, they cannot get a direction of gameplay penalty. If the skates are moving in the correct direction, then no direction of gameplay penalty. The rules say in Rule 4.1.3 that you can only initiate a block while moving counterclockwise, which means blocking while stationary is illegal. Again, we look to the skates because sometimes those wheels are moving fractionally, and if they're moving counterclockwise, then it's not a stopped block. There is no minimum speed. Some people have asked about moving in an exact parallel line across the track. So they're not moving clockwise or counterclockwise, just back and forth, but not stopped either. It's a good question. And the most precise answer I can give you is that it's not illegal. They're moving, and they're not going clockwise. I wouldn't even say it's a no-impact penalty. If you want to call it a loophole because they're not going counterclockwise, well, go ahead. But until there's a rules change or casebook entry, just let it go. 
Direction of gameplay penalties have changed a lot since they were first put into play. If you know a referee who used to work games in the minor penalty days or shortly thereafter, know that there's a very different impact spectrum then than there is now. If we're talking about a clockwise block or stopped block, you're first going to look for your standard impact spectrum. Did the action cause a loss of position relative to that player's opponents? Typically, that means that an opponent passed the victim of this legal action, or did that player go down or out of bounds? For those moving in from the 2015 rules, you'll recall that there was a penalty for knocking someone, quote, severely off balance, unquote. This is a portion of the rules that has been removed, but not because it's now level again, but instead because the rules now give us as referees the ability to determine if the impact is severe enough to warrant a penalty. If the illegal action, in this case a clockwise block, was enough to cause a major impact, for example the loss of points, we can call the penalty even if the blocked skater isn't a hair's breadth from falling over. If it helps, think about our jobs not just as enforcing rules, but of enabling justice. If someone is just good enough to close down a door by illegal actions, even if they would normally be no impact, we can let justice prevail and send the perpetrator away. And if there is no impact, what in the soccer refing world we call trifling, we can let it go as no impact, just as we always have. I've written a piece on RefEd. It's not a video, so you'll need to read it, that goes into the new philosophy of the rules and how to apply this new discretion when it comes to impact upon the game. If you've liked the stuff I put on RefEd, then please read this. This is the biggest change in the rules. It's not something that you can do or not do. The biggest change is our roles as referees in the game. This discretion also applies to what used to be called a sustained clockwise or stopped block. Again, we're being asked to use our best judgments so be able to justify your call when you make them. Generally speaking, though, the way we call them in 2015 is going to be not much different than how we call them in the current rules. If a blocker is actively blocking someone and slowing them down, that is perfectly legal. Coming to a stop? Not so much. But now we can make some considerations. Is the opponent really trying to make an effort to break that stop block, or is she just trying to make a meal out of it and draw a penalty? If they're actually trying, then yes, you have impact. If there's no effort by the person being blocked, then is it justice to penalize someone for what's essentially a positional clockwise block? Which, by the way, the casebook says is not a penalty. So again, use your judgment, but be ready to explain your answers. Some examples of blocks that have major impact. There's a clockwise block that otherwise had no impact, but the blocker continues to push clockwise and stops her opponent from proceeding in the derby direction. However, it can also be multiple clockwise blocks upon the same opponent, even if they would normally be no impact if it was a single block. As long as the opponent who received that clockwise block doesn't have an opportunity to recover from it. Basically a bang bang type of engagement as opposed to a bang bang to risk beating you over the head with this idea, this is a judgment call. You have to see if the person who took the block is able to reset or not before the second block occurs. A sustained stop block is one where there's a block, even a legal block, and the player, while continuing the block, comes to a stop, and despite efforts from her opponent, stays stationary. The most common scenario for a sustained clockwise is often where there's a player who wants to go clockwise, maybe to force someone she knocked out of bounds to come in behind everyone else, but is blocked by an opponent and she keeps pressing rather than disengaging. Be sure to give the players a chance to move again. If, for example, a player slows down an opponent to a stop, we should give that player a reasonable time to realize that she stopped and to resume moving again. I typically use the same beat that I use for a no pack before giving a failure to reform. If this is my typical beat on a division one no pack, no pack, 
failure to reform, then I try to give the same beat for this. Player comes to a stop. Stopped block penalty. You can give more time if you feel it's appropriate. Maybe these are less experienced skaters, and it takes more time for them to realize what they did and how to correct it. But just be sure it's the same metric for everyone in the entire game, not a different metric for different people in the same game. I want to veer slightly askew of how I've done some of the other penalty topics by going into expulsions a bit early. Expulsion for direction of gameplay penalties are pretty much like most other penalties in the rules, meaning that we're looking for something egregious and illegal before recommending or issuing an expulsion. I won't go into the definition of egregious again, like in the other videos. You can look that up yourself if you've missed it. But I've sometimes summed it up as the sweet baby Jesus moment, where you see someone perform an action that's so heinous, you think, oh, sweet baby Jesus. Or whatever phrase you like to use to mix shock and horror. My grandfather was fond of Judas Priest, but not in the headbanger sort of way. This topic I'm about to talk about is the one I really wanted to finish this module on. Because one of the things I've seen a lot over the years is the assumption that if a skater is going clockwise, then that clockwise skater is always the initiator. I need to stress something. Skating clockwise is legal. So, what happens if someone skates clockwise and there's a big old collision between that clockwise skating player and an opponent? First, let's try to just take the clockwise element out of this. Let's say there's a big old collision that you think may be illegal, but both skaters are moving counterclockwise. The first thing you do is try to find out who initiated it. If I'm a skater skating in a straight line in the derby direction and an opponent swerves next to me and plants their face in my shoulder, then goes down in a heap clutching their face, should I get a penalty? No. I didn't initiate the action. That other skater did. Even if she initiated it with her face. Now, apply the same logic to a clockwise skater. If a clockwise skating player has an open lane, but another skater moves into that lane, it's that second skater who initiated, not the clockwise skater. That is not to say that clockwise skaters can't initiate blocks. They certainly can, and they do. That's why this penalty exists. But it is really, really easy to overcall this. Collisions with clockwise skaters can be huge, and it's really easy to pin it on the person who is not going in what some people call, and I have earlier, the derby direction. But don't forget that what they're doing is illegal up until they do something that is illegal. Like much of roller derby, the rules regarding clockwise skating has evolved a lot in a relatively short time frame. It seems to be at a point where skaters have decided that they're good with the level of clockwise travel that's in the game. Just remember that it's not our job to make assumptions about actions. Skaters moving clockwise are really easy to grab our attention because it's counter to what we're used to seeing even with today's derby. But remember that our job as referees are to see the entire picture, not just one skater who grabs our attention. Remember also that if they've grabbed our attention, then chances are they've grabbed the attention of their opponents who may want to stop that clockwise skater. So we have to get back to that larger picture in order, in the event of a collision, we know who actually initiated what. I'd like to thank Donna Olmsted and Preflash Gordon for permission to use their photographs in this presentation. I'd like to thank the Vienna Roller Derby for their permission to use their Ultimate Roller Derby Ubiquitous Magnet Board for this presentation. It can be found at Vienna Roller Derby, 
dot org slash U R D U M B. If you found this presentation helpful, or think it or other presentations at refed.com might be helpful to others, please share this site. But please do not modify it or send it out without appropriate credit for its production. This presentation is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License.